Hello, everyone. Dr. Anna Kabeca here on Couch Talk to talk about fasting, why we do it, how it benefits us, and that really everyone can do it, and how it's so important and has been for centuries, millennia, etc. Today, our special guest is Nadia Pataguana. And she is coming to us out of Canada, has worked with a specialist in the fasting field, Dr. Fung, for quite a while. She's a naturopathic doctor. She's had 15 years of clinical experience helping women and men go through an intense dietary management program that is really based on the concepts and benefits of fasting. So I'm thrilled to have Dr. Nadia Padaguana here with us today. She has been um, coaching people with metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, PCOS, and people who are trying to conceive. So Nadia, great to have you here today. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kobeka. It's a pleasure to be here. Wonderful. Well, tell us how you, um, you know, how you got started in this area, in this field personally. Okay, so uh, you, you were correctly uh, sort of uh, did my bio there for me. I, I am a naturopath. That's my training. At this point, I do work exclusively as a dietary coach for the IDM program with uh, Megan Ramos and Dr. Fung, and we have a few other dietary coaches. Uh, my background uh, um, started, uh, my training started as a naturopath. And, and uh, I still am a naturopath. <laughs> and I, I went to school in Toronto. And I, right after I finished school, I actually moved back to my home country. So we talked a little bit about that earlier. I'm from Mozambique. So I actually lived in Mozambique for 10 years. And I practiced as a naturopath, but my focus was nutrition. So right from the get-go, as a pretty young uh, naturopath, I started seeing people with metabolic syndrome. So I sort of had to figure this business out, which I didn't actually... Uh, know very well. So I had to kind of try to decode it as I went along. And I've always say this, that my Mozambican patients are the most uh, loving and forgiving people. They were wonderful guinea pigs. And so, um, and I had a surplus of them because I was the only person doing this in that part of the world at that time. And so that's how I kind of figured, started to figure things out. Uh, not very well, I have to say, because then I developed metabolic syndrome myself. So that was about eight years ago. Wow. Um, and because of my own struggles with PCOS and, and, uh, infertility, um, I really started to question a lot of things and I learned a lot of things along the way. So that's when I started getting into more of the strict low carb, high fat diets and fasting came a long, long, long time after that. So then I came back to Canada about five years ago. Um, had a couple of children successfully. Thankfully, I was able to conceive. Um, and then I met Dr. Fung and Megan uh, and started working with them because lucky for me, uh, they, they needed somebody with my skill set and I needed a job in Toronto. So this is, I've been with them and I've learned uh, so much from working with these two people um, and brought fasting into my personal life and my, in my practice. And it's made a world of a difference because it basically the two things are trying to ach achieve the same purpose, fasting and a low carb, high fat uh, diet, We're trying to help people uh, manage their insulin status. And so let's talk about that a second, because we hear a lot about insulin and our listeners may be thinking too, you know, what is insulin? What does it do? And, you know, why is it so important we manage insulin. And currently the epidemic of insulin resistance within our country, the US and Canada, right? And how big of a problem this is for us. And it's a key component of metabolic syndrome of PCOS as well. Right. So we actually consider PCOS to be part of the metabolic syndrome umbrella, uh, just like diabetes, just like um, cardiovascular disease, just like cancer, Alzheimer's, uh, infl inflammatory disease. There's so many things that we now can sort of make a connection. And that connection is made through insulin, hyperinsulinemia, which leads to insulin resistance, or it's one and the same as Dr. Fung would say. So I, 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 I hope to do it justice, but I would have to say that, you know, as a resource for people interested in this, the obesity code, which was Dr. Fung's first book, um, that's where he really decodes the insulin theory because up until now we've all been so stuck on the calorie in calorie out theory which has not worked well for anyone really that i know of i don't know if you do so true Dr. Right. Kabeca, but but I, I mean we were so stuck on that and we kept trying to eat less and move more uh for the last you know 
decades and people are just getting sicker and sicker and, and excuse the word, but fatter and fatter and more and more diabetic and, and, and just, you dementia. know, and that's kind of how everything, right? And that's kind of how I got, I always say, this is how I got myself in trouble to begin with because I was a thin person. Uh, very thin, actually, borderline underweight, not because I wanted to, but just the way that I was. And I never had a full meal my entire life. I had, I, I lived on quote unquote healthy snacks. And, you know, fast forward, as I say, 30 years later, and I had metabolic syndrome because my, I was uh, insulin resistant. I, I, I had hyperinsulinemia. And then, of course, I had lots of trouble conceiving and all of that stuff, hypertension. I mean, I had lots and I wasn't even obese. So people get very stuck on the idea, idea of weight and weight loss, but it's what's behind that, right? What, what is behind that? And so insulin is this very important hormone that we only ever hear about when people are diabetic, but how about everything else or the whole process to become diabetic? How about fatty liver? You know, that's an insulin resistant condition. Um, PCOS, as I said, which is what I had, which is polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, at least 70% of women we think with PCOS are insulin resistant. And those that aren't will develop it if the, if the syndrome can, uh, progresses uh, or as the syndrome progresses. So what is insulin? It's a, it's a big, big thing. But just to summarize it, insulin is a hormone that we produce in response to food, to eating. So the more often you eat, the more insulin you're going to produce. As simple as that. So if people are still stuck on this idea of eat small meals many times a day, please keep in mind that you're going to produce more insulin that way. And if you think insulin is a good hormone, of course, everything is good and bad, right? So anything in excess is bad. So you don't want to have too much insulin. You need insulin, of course. You know, and we know this because we have type 1 diabetic kids who don't produce insulin, and um, they can't thrive. So of course we need insulin because it's a storage hormone basically. When insulin goes up, you store, and when insulin goes down, you burn. Mm -hmm. So if you're, uh, you need to store, right? And this is why children need to thrive, they need to store, so they need insulin. So children without insulin need insulin injections. This is obvious. But as you produce so much insulin throughout time because you eat too often, and this is where fasting comes in, of course, for us with uh, helping people with metabolic syndrome, or you eat the foods that produce the highest amount of insulin, then you're going to eventually uh, develop hyperinsulinemia and uh, metabolic syndrome. So the expression of metabolic syndrome, as, we, as we've said, is different for different people. Some people will express that as I did with PCOS, even though they're thin. And other people will express metabolic syndrome or hyperinsulinemia uh, as diabetes or fatty liver or you know all these other conditions that we've talked briefly about. So it's basically a storage hormone. If it's high, you store. If it's low, you burn. Um, it's also a retention hormone. So if it's high, you retain. So who wants to have lots and lots of retention? Nobody. And if it's low, you release. So it's, you can play with this, so you can see. And ideally, everybody would be on at a very good level, so you'd have enough of both worlds. But that's not how most people come to us. They, they already come to us with hyperinsulinemia. So now we have to help reverse this. So let's talk about those levels. What level of insulin, fasting, two hours after meals, three hours after meals are you looking at? So insulin is not something that you can test like blood sugar, unfortunately. So I wouldn't be able to tell you that. So blood sugars is something that you could check. You, you could have a machine that you could check and, and have optimal levels. Insulin is not. You can get a fasting insulin uh, level. I'm going to tell you, and this is not uh, scientific, okay, because I don't know that we're at that level. But I'm going to tell you that the parameter on the labs, and I'm going to use the U.S. Uh, range just because I think that that's mostly the people that probably listen to your show. Right. So the, the U.S. range for fasting insulin, uh, they, they state as an fasting, a normal fasting insulin level to be between, I believe, and, and the different labs will have a different range. But let me just, you know, give you a range, 4 to 19 as being the normal insulin. And it's not the same as blood sugar. So I'm talking about insulin, different, right. completely different levels. And this is what I think. I think that all lab parameters are uh, achieved through testing the general adult population. You test the general American adult population, and we now know that 70 to 80% of them have metabolic syndrome. So that range, I actually, and it says normal on the labs, I actually believe that to be a pure indication that this person 
is already does already have a, a certain level of metabolic syndrome. I would agree. I think what I looked for in my office and my clinic with my patients is fasting insulin below 10. I mean, there really, when it gets around 10, I'm nervous and we're going to start. We're going to look at the hemoglobin A1C and work to improve it, get that fasting level down. And one thing I did in my practices, especially working with gestational diabetics, postpartum, et cetera, is look at glucose to insulin levels. So you're, you, we don't have a home glucose test. You're absolutely right. But the lab can draw your insulin levels. That's right. And so with a two hour you know, uh, fasting glucose tolerance test or glucose to oral glucose tolerance test, you can look at zero, one, two, three hours and what is your glucose to insulin. And it's easy to do. The problem with our current testing is we typically look at glucose, right? And right. a two hour glucose can be back down to 80 and be considered normal, but their insulin right. still up at 50. I mean, That's it right. needs to be also back down to 80% of where it was fasting. So, or, you know, or thereabouts. And um, and so at least um, less than twice its fasting level. So you really want to look at two hour, three hour, how long does it take to get down to baseline? And this is where snacking is so detrimental because you can see if their insulin is still up at two hours, three hours, even if their glucose is down, they are hyperinsulinemic because their body's not, it's not resetting back to zero. And that's what I love about your program is you work with getting that, recreating this insulin sensitivity is like clearing that from your system with that clearing leptin resistance, right? So leptin is the hormone of satiety, satiety, maybe is the word. And yes. so where you feel satisfied, right? So we talk that about- so um, true. So that's so important because you're hungry all the time. And, and I would like you to address, because we're going to go into fasting for our audience. We're going to talk about fasting, how to accomplish it, so and why it's so beneficial. But I know there are some of you that become hope, hypoglycemic when you are close to missing a meal. So Nadia, I would love for you to address that and how you deal with this issue and also to allay fears of fasting and how we can really conquer the problem here with the hypoglycemic kind of reaction that people are getting. Absolutely. And I think that you, Dr. Kabeka, you actually said something that's really important for people to realize. So keeping in mind uh, the little bit that I've told you about insulin and how it's a storage and a, um, a retention hormone, um, when you're in storage mode, meaning when your insulin is a bit higher, you feel like eating, right? And when your insulin is a bit lower, you don't feel like eating because you have your body just burns your own fat and you're in burning state. And so you have all this energy. Most of us uh, that follow the standard uh, American diet, and, and I, I love how it's called standard American diet because I'm from Mozambique, which is in the Southern Hemisphere uh, in Africa. And I got to tell you that they follow a standard American diet too. So there you go. <laughs> Thank I wish you. we would call it standard world diet. So, um, unhealthy diet. <laughs> right. <laughs> so then most of us, as you correctly stated, you eat, your sugar goes up and then your insulin responds to that sugar. So carbohydrates, especially refined carbs are the, the nutrient that is going to provoke the highest, uh, insulin response, protein, provokes a moderate insulin response, and fat provokes an ins insignificant insulin response, okay? So when we eat, and most of us eat carbs, high carbs, um, healthy carbs as they want to call them, <laughs> but anyway, you produce an insulin response, and then as you correctly stated, insulin, insulin's job is to actually lower your blood sugar, to take it out of the blood as quickly as possible. Where it puts it, it doesn't matter, right? And people don't seem to care. It takes it out of your blood and puts it somewhere. But as long as it's out of your blood, people seem to be uh, comfortable. What happens is, as you said, insulin is still a bit high. It's already taken out of your blood. So if you're insulin resistant, you're actually going to have a higher insulin response because your body's going to produce more insulin in response to the same foods. So it's going to go a little higher. That might actually cause a reactive hypoglycemia, which is what happened with me. So your insulin actually goes down your sugar, sorry, uh, your blood sugar actually goes down a little lower than it should. And then you feel all shaky. And then even though your insulin is still high, you need to eat again. And so this is going to cause an even higher insulin. And so you get into this vicious circle of eating all the time. And of course, when your insulin is high, you don't crave protein and fat, you crave sugar. Mm -hmm. because you've, you've just gone uh, a little low in your sugar. It's not because you need sugar. It's because it, too much insulin is taking too much 
sugar out of your bloodstream and put it into your organs and your fat cells, which you definitely don't want. But that's, this is the vicious cycle that we're in. So how do we get people out of this cycle? Yeah, let's go into it. <laughs> so the only way I know how is to uh, change your, your dietary intake. So then uh, I follow a ketogenic diet, which is a strict low carb, moderate protein, high fat diet. I didn't want to follow a ketogenic diet, I have to tell you, and I've tried everything you can possibly think of. Um, I did it to get pregnant um, and I worked and then I thought, I don't need this. I don't want to do this. And then I got my insulin status even higher after pregnancy. Mm -hmm. um, a lot more severe metabolic syndrome, a lot harder to get pregnant the second time. And then after that, I finally said, okay, I do need it. Uh, that's where I need to be. I've tried a lot of moderate and liberal low carb diets. It didn't work for me because of that insulin cycle. It just make, made me hungrier all the time. And so I, need to, I needed to get myself into a state where my insulin level was at a point, my blood sugars were stable, and I was getting um, constant uh, levels of energy because the up and down is really what killed me and caused me to just graze my entire life. Mm -hmm. So um, that is one method. You change your diet. You change the nutrients that I, like I said, that create an insulin response. So I did it initially. I didn't know Dr. Fung and Megan then. I did it through uh, a diet. Um, much lower carbs, moderate amounts of protein, and very, very high fat. This kept me satiated, as you said. It worked on my leptin resistance. Um, I ate less times a day because I wasn't hungry, so I had about two meals a day, two large meals a day. Didn't change my caloric intake in a negative way, and I do measure it not because I care about calories, but because I like to track things so that I can inform people. Mm -hmm. um, I have more information. So... Uh, I actually went up in calories quite a bit from switching to a ketogenic diet uh, just because a f a fat, fat is, more calories. It has more calories than, than carbs, more than double than carbs and protein. All right. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the, the premise behind a ketogenic diet. It's, it's really follows the, the insulin theory that Dr. Dr. Fung talks about in the obesity code. Um, so that's how I did it initially. Then I met Megan and Dr. Fung and realized that you could fast and oh boy, was that ever useful uh, for me and my husband, uh, more my husband than me, because at that point I had gotten myself to a very, I didn't have much weight to lose. I had about 20 or 30 pounds to lose uh, because I did, my metabolic syndrome unfortunately didn't start with weight, but then the weight st started to come on because insulin is a storage hormone. And the higher your insulin, if you're snacking and eating when your insulin is already higher, you're going to store even more. So eventually the pounds started to to, to to pile up, unfortunately. And so, you know, with a keto diet, I got myself, my insulin status was at two. Okay. And that's where it is now. It's, yeah. it's on the scale. It says below normal, mm -hmm. but that's where my insulin needs to be. If it's higher than that, I develop hypertension. Uh, if it's higher than that, my PCOS uh, goes crazy. And crazy PCOS for me means a lot of unpleasant symptoms. I get a lot of acne, um, especially in this side of my face, a lot of hirsutism, which is hair growth, um, dark spots. You know, it comes with a lot of unpleasant physical symptoms. Um, and a lot of, you know, I stop ovulating, I stop menstruating, who wants to do that, right? I mean, that's just chaotic. And so that's what I did. Then I met these guys and it's like, well, you can fast. And that's very interesting. And I got to um, shadow them in clinic and watch their, how they treated patients and how they properly monitored people through intermittent fasts, as well as some extended fasting. Dr. Fung wrote a blog about this uh, in the idmprogram.com website. He writes a weekly blog. He wrote a blog about this last week about how we don't necessarily put everybody through an extended fast. It's something that we do with proper supervision, although some people can fast uh, very easily on their own. And as long as they know, uh, like you correctly stated, we recommend a water fast. So we don't recommend dry fasting ever under any circumstance. Um, and we do talk also about electrolytes. So the proper electrolyte, because, because insulin is a retention hormone, when you fast and your insulin drops, your body will let go of a lot of liquid. 
right? A lot of unwanted liquid. But with that, you will lose some electrolytes. And so then you could potentially dehydrate. So we never recommend that people fast without knowing their sort of electrolyte balance and knowing what electrolytes they need. And normally we're talking about sodium and magnesium. And you're talking about extended fasting, not intermittent fasting. Even with intermittent fasting, we talk about electrolytes. I dehydrate very easily. I get, uh, I get very nauseous and even headaches if I don't take electrolytes right from the get-go when I start a short fast. Um, so we always do this individually. It's, there, we don't have a, a strict electrolyte recommendation for people, especially because you really need to know people's electrolyte status and kidney function. Mm -hmm. So it's a, lot of, uh, it's a little bit of work here to get the, the proper balance. But once you do get the balance, it's a bit trial and error. It's always, and so the, the good thing about things like magnesium and sodium is that when you take a little too much, as long as your kidney status mostly is functional, uh, if you take a little too much, your body gets rid of it. So if I overdo it in my salt or magnesium, I get loose stools. And I know it right away because I do tend to uh, rather go a little over than a little under because I don't feel well if I go a little under. Um, and so this is important, uh, electrolyte status and, and hydration. So do you measure red blood cell magnesium and then determine from there? Uh, I don't know if it's red blood cell magnesium, whatever the magnesium is on the labs. Okay. Um, but no, usually no. Usually if kidney function is, is, is proper, then we just give a sort of um, optimal dose and people play with that. Because again, I cannot take magnesium on my eating days, for example, because I will get loose stools, any amount of magnesium. I have plenty. I don't need any more. But if I fast and I don't take any magnesium, I'll get muscle cramps. Mm -hmm. um, okay. And so I, then I play with my dose. So I, my dose is different than my husband's dose. He takes magnesium on a daily basis. I can't. Whereas I take a lot more salt than he does on my fasting days because I, I feel like I need it. He takes hardly any. I wish he took a little bit more, but he doesn't feel like he needs it. And so it's hard to get it into him. Mm. Yeah. So, so from a fasting perspective, you know, we're talking about as simple as having main meals and not snacks. You know, that's, that's fasting in between meals or uh, longer intermittent fast, like an, an 18 6 schedule is a very common schedule, a 16 8, where people fast for 16 or 18 hours and then eat within a six to eight hour window. That's a very common uh, sort of fast, a very safe fast. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't talk about hydration or salt or minerals for most of those people, right? Because that's pretty safe. Right. Some people do a 24 hour fast. Uh, what's called OMAD, one meal a day, uh, or, or some people call it the warrior diet where they eat um, uh, within a four-hour period and fast for 20 hours. That's usually pretty easy for most people to do. And I think it's because um, your body burns through your glycogen stores in about 20 hours. So it's when those, that, that easily accessible fuel is gone, people start to feel hungry. It's not our preferred method. And I think Dr. Fung and Megan have talked quite a bit about this in our podcasts and, and all that. You don't want to slow down people's metabolism by only eating one meal a day. You don't want a low, uh, low calorie diet uh, on mm -hmm. an ongoing basis. Some people do feel very well on a one meal a day approach. And if they get to that point and they have reached their goal, I'm not against it. Mm -hmm. uh, it might even have some merit. But if you're trying to lose weight, if you're trying to speed up your metabolism, if you're trying to reverse uh, metabolic syndrome, I, I don't think that that would be my preferred method. And then we can talk about more extended fasts for different uh, people, alternate day fasting to sort of speed up the process and, and sort of help people normalize their blood sugars and hopefully help them get off with proper medical supervision, get off certain medications and lowering weight. Well, and there are two key components to this. We want to activate autophagy, right? We want to activate like where our body's eating off its own nasty cells, right? The unhealthy cells, the cancer cells, the fat cells, you know, we want that state of autophagy. So I want you to talk about that. And also what we'll see and what Dr. Fung talks about um, as well is the mTOR. It's like when we activate mTOR and how the principles that you put in this intensive dietary management work to optimize these two things to help decrease the metabolic syndrome, the insulin resistance, the cardiovascular disease, the Alzheimer's, the cancer patients that you guys are known for treating. So I would love for you to hit the pearls on that and, and go into those key concepts, autophagy and mTOR. All right. So... <laughs> 
Those are biggies. This is I hate right. mTOR. I, <laughs> I I I I know that you're you're a lot more techy than I am, Doctor Quebeca. So I, if you can, in your when you're posting this on your I'll site, and, a oh, please show them a picture of mm -hmm. what mTOR looks like. So I do not understand mTOR from a chemical or even scientific sort of perspective. I cannot analyze and tell you all the different intricate parts to that pathway because it, you know, if you can show them a picture, they will begin okay. to appreciate the compli how complicated it is. But let's start with the basics. So autophagy uh, is now something that we know and are aware of uh, in, in big part because of um, a Japanese physicist that won the Nobel Prize, I think it was in 2016 now, uh, if I'm not mistaken, where he showed that fasting would trigger autophagy. So it's not that autophagy hasn't been known for longer, but so this, and I don't know how to pronounce his name, so I won't try. So this doctor um, uh, won the Nobel Prize in physiology because he was able to show that fasting, so let's say that any period of fasting, but uh, Obviously, and I'll explain that in a bit more detail. So fasting seems to trigger autophagy. Autophagy is exactly what you just described it as. It's probably a lot more complicated than I can describe it, but it really is your body's ability to sort of uh, eat, eat away all of its um, um, garbage bits that it wants to throw out of the body, right? It's, it's called an anti-aging. I've heard it called so many things, you know, anti-aging, rejuvenating, sort of... Um, you know, prevention against all of these things that you've just said, cancer and all these other conditions. So what this uh, physicist showed is that when you go into a fasting state, you trigger autophagy. And this is, this has to do with the whole idea of insulin in part. So as insulin seems to go down, the antagonizing hormone to insulin is glucagon. So then it is glucagon that triggers autophagy. So the question then is, you know, how long do you have to be fasting before you can trigger autophagy? I don't know. I think if I look at it from that perspective, it depends on your insulin status. So right. then again, we go back to our original conversation. If you're hyperinsulinemic like I was, have high levels of insulin, uh, if you have insulin resistance and you're going to respond to everything that you eat with much more insulin than you should, your insulin status is going to be higher than what it should. We talked about the labs as well. Then, you know, how long is it going to take? How long are you going to have to fast in order to drop your insulin enough so that glucagon goes up? And once glucagon, which is another hormone, it's the antagonizing hormone, when glucagon goes up is when you trigger autophagy. And you want autophagy. Who doesn't? Um, if you, you know, it's a big topic. Uh, but, you know, we've just summarized all the wonderful benefits of it. There are a lot other uh, wonderful benefits to fasting that may even be related to this mTOR pathway that I don't even know. But Dr. Fung has talked about this um, in his blogs and in his books. He's written a second book on fasting. So um, we know that after a certain uh, period of fasting, your body actually produces more growth hormone. So then you build more muscle. And this makes total sense if you look at our evolutionary history. Um, you know, if you look at people that were had to fast, now we fast, it's a voluntary choice, but people had to fast for a whole number of reasons. Uh, initially, because they had to they had to, to uh, hunt and gather. So they fasted until they could get food. And that would be long periods of time uh, sometimes, right? They would go through. And so it would make total sense that their body would become stronger as they would continue their hunt so that they could actually fast and not the other way around. If they became weaker, the likelihood of them actually making a hunt would be uh, would, would decrease. And, and then our, our genes and our species just wouldn't have, wouldn't have survived. So this has been, Dr. Fung would describe this much better than me, of course, You're but we awesome. do, oh, yeah, thanks. great. Thank you. <laughs> so we know that we produce more growth hormones as well when we, when we fast. And if we exercise in a fasting state, well, that, that's just a double whammy, right? Cause then uh, you're building even more muscle and we can, we can, we can actually see this, you know, through DEXA scans, people that do a DEXA scan before they start a fasting regimen and then check, do another DEXA scan a few months into it. You can see 
And this is a really critical point because on low calorie diets, you see a decline in muscle mass, decline in bone mass in Absolutely. You know, very strict low calorie diets. But with fasting, with engaging mTOR, improving your body's natural ability to eliminate unhealthy, wasteful cells, right? And, um, and that improves muscle mass, improves bone density. And I know too, as uh, you know, practice, continue to practice and play with fasting, just the increase in flexibility, clarity, I call it energized enlightenment that you get. And uh, my programs are all keto alkaline. So alkaline ending ketosis at the same time in working with my population of women has been just fabulous. But getting into the state, and I think in, in numbers, you're absolutely right. Like we don't know how long it's going to take each individual unless you're testing mm -hmm. to figure out if, if they're in autophagy, right? Or if they're mTOR, um, what their mTOR level is. And that this should be somewhere between some two to three days, right? I mean, but it depends. But on average, for the average, well, like whoever's average, right? right. But it could be easily two to three days. Yeah, I think we always use the 72 hour mark as our kind of thing, because we know that that's when the growth hormone levels peak. And I do think that this again, if I if I if I could decipher the mTOR pathway, this would all make a lot more sense. But because I can't decipher it, uh, <laughs> then we just kind of use this this range. It's it's believed that some people actually do get some benefits of autophagy even through sleep uh, through that. So it's there's so much information out there and, and I, I learn every single day. I mostly learn from our patients, right? So, I mean, that there's no better way to learn than that way. I could read till, uh, Oh, I think the <laughs> and your clinical experience is hugely valuable. Give us an example. We were talking a little bit before we started recording about one of um, the women that you actually coached today. So we were talking about the, the fact that some, some people go into fasting a lot easier than others, okay? And, and I, I always use, when I'm in my groups, I always use myself and my husband as an example. This guy can just go into a fast straight from a high calorie, a high, sorry, high carb mm -hmm. meal, just right into it, super high insulin level. He can just do it. I cannot, okay? I need to get myself into a ketogenic state, meaning that my body is burning fat for fuel before I can easily fast because, you know. So well, I was talking- that point, not yes. to interrupt, but Nadia, yes. with that point for our listeners is that when we get into a ketogenic state or when we're actually producing ketones in our urine, we're decreasing our hunger hormone, ghrelin. And so that hunger hormone tends to peak during a fast around, you know, maybe 36 to 48 hours. It depends. So you're really hungry. Make it through day two, day three gets better. But again, don't go into a fast for our listeners. We're talking now three day fast and we're going to talk longer. Don't do this without regularly detoxing, without regularly intermittent fasting, without nutritional mineral support. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't want you to jump right into this. So, oh, for uh, sure. It takes, it takes, Time. It takes some preparation, okay? And I'm glad that Dr. Fung wrote that book, the second book, because I think that that helps to guide people through it. Um, of course, people in our program have, have the dietary coaches to help them through. Um, so it makes it easier. But a lot of people do, can do this on their own with, the, with enough information. They gather and research enough information. So anyway, I was talking about a patient today who unfortunately um, is having a really hard time uh, fasting. And it makes total sense. She's on medication that raises her insulin. Her insulin status is very, very high. She cannot um, seem to get herself in a ketogenic state from diet because it would it, it just takes her a lot longer to get. It takes most people two to five days to go into ketosis through a strict low carb diet. And, and even those people, that initial phase, as you were calling it a detox, we sort of call that the induction phase or the carb flu is not fun, but most people can make it through. They know what to expect. There are some tools to help make it a little bit easier, but this lady just cannot. And the reason for that is that her insulin status is so high. She's so insulin resistant. It's so much harder for her. So, you know, I'm constantly trying, she's, you know, fairly new to our program. I'm constantly trying to give her uh, uh, it's not, and this is what the point that you said at the very beginning, it's not that people can't, there are people that can't fast. Everybody can fast and everybody would benefit from fasting, but getting them to that point, right? Getting their insulin, uh, lower so that they can, of course, if you jump into a fast, your insulin is going to drop. So if you just say, I'm going to starve like my husband, I am going to be just fine because he's done it enough times and his insulin just goes right down. He is in ketosis the next day because he does, he's done this so often. 
Um, and so for some people, it may take them two or three weeks to get into ketosis. And that's two or three weeks of this so-called carb flu, right? Of this state of not feeling well. Um, so you need to sort of give them the right tools for that. And while I'm at it, I'm just going to say not everybody can fast. Children can't fast. You heard me say at the very beginning that uh, children need insulin because it's a storage hormone, right? Otherwise, they won't thrive. So there are people that shouldn't fast. Pregnant women shouldn't fast for obvious reasons. Right. But yes. most healthy adults uh, and unhealthy adults <laughs> could and should fast. <laughs> right. Right. Absolutely. So give us an example of a patient that you've had otherwise with cancer or, you know, and you've watched them clinically. What have some of your clinical results been? I actually don't uh, see the, the cancer patients. It's Megan and Dr. Fung. I see mostly the... Um, um, diabetics no. on insulin. Uh, those come to me at this point because Megan is no longer taking those people. She's uh, focused on a, a few other things. Um, uh, morbidly obese people. You, you said I, you know, my special passion, of course, is to help women conceive. Um, so I currently don't have of course, everybody has people who have, who have had cancer or have cancer, but those are not that's not the reason why people come to me. Uh, they come to me because they have metabolic syndrome and they want to lower their insulin status. And the expression is usually diabetes or obesity. So I do see a wide range of patients. Um, I'm, I'm trying to help people get off of medications through the right medical supervision. I work in office with a couple of doctors that work with us. So they get to do that uh, part of helping people decrease their medication. And I help to, I get to help them through their diet and fasting. Very nice. Yeah. So what would be your course for a client coming in to see you? Our, pay, our program is very patient led. We, we I, I, at least I like it that way. So everybody that comes into our program has to, is required to do a, 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 a training course and Megan does the training. So she's in charge of doing the, the initial training. So she gets. One second, Nadia, I lost you. Hmm. Hold on one second. Sorry, I lost you. So you were saying, um, I think I lost you at um, uh, when your patient comes in, they go through a training with Megan. That's right. <laughs> that's right. Sorry about that. So, okay. so Megan is, so that's how our patients start. So because they do this training uh, portion with Megan, most of the time when I, when I first see them, so then they join my groups, when I first see them, they actually come come with an idea or a plan most of the time, not all the time. Um, and then we go over that plan. Okay. So that, that usually involves some dietary changes and some, some, uh, intermittent fasting schedule. If they haven't come up with their own plan, then I will come up with a plan for them based on the history that I know of them and what their comfort level is. I usually start pretty conservative from, from my standards. So I won't get somebody on an extended fast unless they've done one. People that do extended fast and have done them on their own always want that to be part of their plan because they know about autophagy and they know about, you know, all the things that we were just discussing about. So people that have done extended fasts and are comfortable with extended fasts always want that in their plan. But people who have never fasted, I would never tell them to go on an extended fast to begin with. Um, in very, there are very particular cases that I might and that would be an in-office sort of situation with medical supervision where you're trying to get people to a certain state either it's because of a medication or you know imagine somebody's on the verge of going on insulin or worse uh, imagine they're on the verge of going on dialysis or something like that I mean it would make sense then that you would um be a little extreme at the start. Right. right. So that is not, and that's what Dr. Fung has to deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. So that's not what, what we usually deal with. So most of the time I would put somebody on, if they're, if, if they're interested in trying a ketogenic diet, I would tr teach them how to do that properly um, with some intermittent fasts. 
uh, always. Our program is a fasting program. It's not even a keto program. So uh, being keto is not a, a, a requirement, but if somebody is struggling through a fast like I do to get into fasting, then the only way that I know to make it easier is to put them in a ketogenic state first yes. through diet. No, I agree. Fat satiates us. Hopefully fats, that is. So right. when we are going then monitoring them, I'm curious on the extended fast, water fast, is there anything besides water they can drink? Yeah, there's a lot of things. And Megan is, like I said, Megan is the one that has, uh, I just remind people as we go along, but she trains people into this whole thing. So she talks about what we call our training wheels or our crutches. And we all have our crutches. I, my crutch is, uh, I drink a lot of coffee and tea. Um, but water is the key thing, right? Because even um, coffee and tea are diuretics. So they're going to put you into a dehydrated state that you don't want to be in. So you, you need to make sure that you got a lot more um, water and then the electrolytes we talked about, right? But then we have the training wheels, the crutches that people use all the time, you know, the bulletproof coffees that you hear so much about. Are we big fans of them? Probably not the biggest, but is it okay for people if they're trying to extend a fast? It, you know, it probably is. Now, if you, people start saying to me, well, how about autophagy? You know, mTOR is very complicated, but we're, we're, we're pretty certain that any calorie and any amount of amino acids, so even bone broth, would kick you out of autophagy. Right. So that, you know, that we got to keep the two things separate. In order for you to go into autophagy, you would have to do a pure water fast, I think. You know, we're pretty certain about that. We don't even know if coffee would, would kick you out of autophagy. Um, and so that, that's the kind of thing. That's that a challenge because. It's a challenge. Yeah, that's the challenge until we can understand that better. It's hard. It's hard to know. Strictly, you know, it's, it's um, you know, eliminating any other thing that your body could rely on for fuel. Well, so. you want, that's the whole point is you want your body to go and get its own fuel. Yeah. So if you need the crutch, it's fine. Um, right. Yes, I agree. But eventually, I think as people get more used to fasting, it becomes easier and easier to fast and your body goes into your stores much easier so that you don't need it. I personally do not have any bone broth or bulletproof coffees or fat or anything when I fast. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I do water, I do electrolytes and I do some coffee and tea, uh, plain black. Uh, no cream, no nothing, but lots of people do, you know, some fat in their coffee or tea, uh, or even like a tablespoon of it to get them going just to get to a certain point. Um, and that's baby okay. steps, right? Baby steps. Baby steps. That's yes. the safest way. And then you learn to discern what works, what doesn't work and how that's you can right. push yourself to the next level. You don't start running a marathon at 25 miles, right? That's exactly it. 100 yards. And I'm on like the couch to 5k. I'm still on week one. I've been there for a few weeks. <laughs> Almost we'll find something else to do. But anyway, my point was baby steps. <laughs> baby steps for sure. Yeah. And I always say this, if you've got a three-year-old and you're going to put them on a bike, you're going to put them on a bike with training wheels. If they right. don't need them, they'll get rid of them as they go, right? That's usually what happens. They start to, one falls off one side and then the other side one falls off. And that's kind of why we call them training wheels. Yeah, no, great example. Great example. So tell people how they can work with you directly and also get more information. So our program is now strictly... Uh, um, online with new patients we take we still have an in-office program but we currently are taking in new patients into our online program um, the website is um, IDM pro so intensive dietary management IDM program .com. Um, you can schedule an initial consult so that you can meet one of the counselors it wouldn't might not be me it might be one of the other ones um, and then you would have a 20 minute initial consult that you could then go over the program um, it, it's a coaching group program and then you could choose one of the packages available our packages are based on the number of calls that people think they'd like to have with us initially to start and then you can always add on as you go we do have a new program which is we're very excited about it hasn't launched yet but it's a membership program so for people who don't feel like they need the coaching program they don't need to have somebody uh, on call to answer their questions uh, in the group uh, setting, then you could join the the membership program, which is very looks very promising uh, because it's a lot of uh, weekly information. There's Q and A sessions. There's group fasts. There's a somebody who's going to start working with us um, 
and we're very excited about. She's going to lead group fasts. Um, And there's a lot of other components to the membership program. And it is a monthly thing. So people could, uh, it's not such a big commitment as, as the, as the coaching program, they could just go month to month and see how, how they feel about this. That sounds great. Okay, so idmprogram.com. And y'all are based out of Canada, but you have your virtual online program and Dr. Jason Fung, F-U-N-G. And he has his book on fasting, which is available on Kindle, Amazon, and just good information, good science. And his first book was Obesity Code. So those are good resources. I mean, just wealth of scientific information that you can geek out on and enjoy. (laughs) But it's also some good principles that he outlines in there to understand it better and also to eliminate some fear with fasting. And, and I think that's key. And again, in um, my audience knows I'm big on intermittent fasting and even, um, you know, the keto alkaline aspect. And I found that really combining the two just is great for hormone balancing. Um, And, you know, that anti-aging aspects of it are so good. So Dr. Nadia, I want to thank you for being on our call today. And thank you so much for sharing your information and your personal story with us. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. This was really nice. Thank you. Thank you.